said we shouldn't think about the uh, we shouldn't think about the Kuznets curve, but I thought about it anyway because it seems like the poor countries inequality is going up, but the three million income countries is sort of peaked or maybe going down. So isn't that process is like structural change, homogenization of the labor market, earning education is more equalized, sucking up of the surplus labor that is out there. Aren't that forces that help explain what's going on and might continue driving inequality down? Is that, or what is your prediction? Is it going to go up again or what? There was a question in the back, Ricardo. Thank you, Ricardo Santos from uh, When You Weather. I'm going to direct it to, to Neri, please, uh, on, on Brazil. Uh, we conducted uh, a study, it's also published as a UNU Weather paper with uh, Nala Kabir, and we looked into inter a group inequalities. And one of the things that we noticed comparing the beginning of Lula's mandate and the end of mid Dilma's was that there was a reduction in group inequality intersecting them, but uh, there was a story on the labor market because there wasn't change in the, how the labor market was segmented. So there was still a concentration of less, least of groups or lesser, better, uh, less better off groups in, in the less paid occupations. What happened was that those less paid occupations got a boost because the minimum wage got higher because of formalization of the labor market. And that kind of pinpointed that there was a limit to the, to the reduction of inequality, a structural limit to the reduction of inequality in Brazil. And we had the hope that intergenerationally there would be something, uh, some hope. Unfortunately, I don't think the hope was, <laughs> with, with your information, the hope is not that obvious. So the question is, is there a floor in Brazil or and how can we break it? Okay, uh, Luis up here. And then one question here, and then. Hi, this is a superb session. Congratulations, Finn, uh, and all the presenters. Um, I have a quick question about gender inequality. There was a mixed treatment of it in the presentation. Uh, India and South Africa in particular seem to leave it out. Uh, Pete, it would seem to me that your data set in particular could allow you to look very much at household and individual uh, inequality and tease out some of the gender inequality. And certainly, Murray, your focus on labor income uh, might help. And I found your focus on demographic interesting and, and could benefit from a gender story as well. If you have comments on, if you found something, just let, you can let me know, let us know now or you can tell me afterwards. Thanks, we'll, we'll take Andrea first to just uh, finish off here. Oh, okay, you can go back there, don't worry. Which one is not? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Bola Awutide. I'm in Nigeria, but I work in Mali with the World Vegetable Center. Um, I want to uh, ask questions on the presentation of Shili, uh, basically on uh, China. Uh, it's very interesting to me to know that, um, because to my own understanding, I know that uh, poverty and income inequality are closely related and highly correlated, particularly with respect to Africa. So it's very interesting to me to know how China was able to achieve a reduction in poverty in the midst of high inequality. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, likewise, a very, very interesting session. Now, uh, aside from Murray, now the labor market in South Africa probably is unequalizing because of the structure of the economy. You have the people working in the mining sector that are highly paid and the people working in the, in the other sectors, there. and this, I don't know, unless the, the structure of the economy won't change, I mean, this is an hypothesis, uh, th then uh, this will go with, stay with you forever. Now, the second uh, question, which is, a, eh? well, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> everything happens. Now, the other thing is that uh, there, there were all these corrections for uh, uh, tax returns. Now, uh, I raised a question <coughs> yesterday, I mean, now, in India, there are the non-resident Indians, and they don't pay taxes in India. And in Brazil, uh, the story of uh, uh, Verdi that I mentioned yesterday, according to him, I mean, the incomes of the people uh, who hold assets abroad, it's not that they don't pay taxes in Brazil. 
and they don't come up in the survey. They don't pay, they don't even appear in the national income. So that, that how large are they? Because if this uh, is taken into account, and then Zokman and, and Dikumana and others, they've done all these efforts. And uh, in, in Africa, for instance, the Nikumana says that the total asset held abroad by the Africans are equal to the total public debt of Africa. So it's a large amount, a large amount of sources, and these are very unequally distributed. So, so if the, the the levels of inequality in the giants may be higher, and the last point is an observation that uh, for uh, what the Pangyo Lishi, maybe my friend Lishi, because I mean in South Africa transfers uh, and in Brazil transfers are highly redistributive, in China they are regressive, so there is a large large degree of uh, policy. Uh, improvement there, I think. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Other questions? Other questions? Okay. Then we'll turn to the uh, panelists. Uh, we'll take them in the same order as uh, the presentation. So Pete first, Nishi, uh, Marcelo, and then Murray. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Louise. I, I, I have to apologize for not having put up a slide on, on gender issues because that's clearly a critical uh, group as well uh, across which we can look at differences. And the evidence that we have is, is kind of a mixed picture. I mean, at the national level, what you're seeing is um, you know, there are improvements, for example, in education outcomes and so on. Uh, the gaps between uh, uh, men and women are, are declining. But one very worrying development that's observable in the data as well is that labor force participation of women is actually declining uh, over time in India. And this picture of a kind of, this kind of mixed picture is not just something that occurs at, this, at the aggregate level from these secondary data sources, but then there's also there's a nuanced and very mixed picture that occurs at the, at the very micro level as well. So it's an important dimension of inequality. It doesn't, it's, it's evolving, but it doesn't seem to be diminishing uh, as such. Um, on the question of the non-resident Indians and the wealth that's held abroad, I, mean, I guess I don't really know exactly how we should treat non-resident Indians, whether they should be part of the Indian population or they should be part of the population where they are resident. Um, but if it's a, case, a question of the wealth that's held by Indians that's held abroad, I mean, that I, I, I recognize is obviously something that would potentially be a big factor. And I also see how that wouldn't be captured by these tax uh, records data. So that would, that would remain an important omission. Um, it might be reflected to some extent in this exercise that we haven't, I uh, wasn't able to report on where we're looking at trying to fill in this top incomes gap by looking not at tax returns, but to, uh, uh, but looking at um, sort of house price data and try to see if we can get a handle on on sort of wealth uh, 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 at the, of the very top end by looking at the house prices at the very top end of the, of the house price distribution. So we're doing some work on, on that at the moment, uh, building on an exercise that is done in, uh, along similar lines in Egypt that revealed actually a very considerable, was actually in some sense able to replicate this, uh, this top end inequality uh, component coming out of tax records, but then through house price data instead of tax records data. So possibly that might capture the, uh, an element of what you're describing. I think those are the questions that were directed at me. Okay, is she? Yeah. Uh, I have a three questions. Yeah, the first from Ani. Uh, you mentioned that whether <coughs> what will be change in the income equality in the futures, whether we can uh, use Kuzmir hypothesis to predict that. Uh, you see, yeah. To answer your questions, we should look at what kinds of you say, equalized elements and the disequalized elements, something that like, uh, already happened in recent years. So if you just look at equalizing elements, like uh, the migration will be continued, something like that, and there will be more and more migrants will be integrated into the urban community, something like that. Also, the government will yes, uh, issue some more distributive of the policies and will be set up social network for the, all the population, including the rural population, something like that. So I think that will be equalized, income equality in the future. You see. Also, the government yes, uh, put greater effort in the fighting the poverty in rural areas, 
give a lot of transfer to the poor household. Yeah, I think that is a positive yeah, impact on the reducing the income equality. Also, we should realize some disequalities elements, something like that. I just mentioned that it's very difficult to predict what will be happened in economic transition and the political transition, something like that. You say even you say scholar proposed to reduce the government intervention in the you say economic activity, something like that. But uh, it seems, you say, the government just gets stronger and stronger and more and more intervention in economic activity indeed. So corruption will be there, and some red-seeking activity will be there. Also some monopoly of SOE will be there, something like that. That will have some decent equality, yeah, on the in income equality. Something. So it's hard to predict, you say, whether income equality will be declining or increase. So conservatives, yeah, conservatively, I say, okay, perhaps in the next five or 10 years, income equality will remain the high levels, will be, you say, quite stable, something like that, yeah. Uh, so second question is that, you say, uh, even China have rising income equality, also have China have achieved uh, yes, a, a great progress in the poverty reductions. You see. Uh, so as I mentioned that, if you just look at income growth curve, that is, even in the different period, you will find even the lower income group still have some positive you see, income growth. Yeah, uh, yeah sometimes you say the growth rate is lower than the high income group, but still have maybe 4%, 3%, you say income group, the growth. That is for the poor household, the lower income group, they really benefit from yeah, income growth, just less than the high income group. So also the Chinese government put a great effort uh, in the reducing the poverty, particularly in rural areas, because the poverty is more concentrated in rural yeah, areas. So, so I think most important, uh, the policy is that try to create more employment opportunity for the poor people. Also try to put more resources in the area that is poor people more concentrated in something like that. Just try to reduce the poverty through regional development, something like that. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, so that is uh, the poverty reduction is take place with rising income equality. That's why. So, so come to third question from Andrew. So yeah, uh, if you just look at trend in Impact of transfers on the income equality. Just look at after you say transfer income, something like that. It's progressive. The why? Just because you say most uh, <coughs> part of transfers are the the urban pension. You see, urban retired people just get very high pension indeed. So. Before they get pension, they are low income group. After they get pension, they then become high income group. So pension is so important, you see, make a big difference yeah, between income distribution before transfer income, after transfer income, that is. Okay, Marcel. Um. So starting just a, a brief comment about the Kuznets curve. Uh, you know, uh, Milanovic talked about the Kuznets waves, and I think Brazil is entering maybe in a second wave. You know, it's going up. So it's Brazilian are good surfers, you know, now these days. So. <clears throat> the, 
just a, a small thing related with, with with that. I think there's a, a, a interesting parallel between what's happened in China in the last 20 years, what happened in Brazil during the economic miracle. I think there is we can learn a lot about. Uh, and then going to a, a, uh, sorry about um, um, informality, minimum wage. Um, <clears throat> The Brazilian case, if, if you get all the productive attributes, not only uh, formality, but also education, technical core, size of the firm, everything that's correlated with positively with earnings. The Brazilian case, when inequality was going down, there are two parts of the story. The first part is that people are moving to the better attributes becoming more formal, getting better education from very low level, but that's part. And the second is that the big jump in earnings happen on those without those attributes, not only returns of education falling, but also you know, the informal, formal sector differential falling, etc. A key point, minimum wage explains a lot in Brazil, but also explains a lot from the fiscal problem we have now. Because, you know, in Brazil, uh, uh, minimum wage affects the labor market, affects the informal labor market even more than the formal labor market. So the illegal workers, quote unquote, follow the law. It's, uh, but all the pension system, unemployment insurance, everything follows the minimum wage. So basically, the minimum wage is not the floor, it basically, is in the median of the distribution. What's really in the floor is, is uh, uh, Bolsa Familia, you know, and things. So uh, going to Andrea's uh, uh, point, you know, uh, overall, you know, Brazil, like South Africa, we have a huge transfer system, has a huge fiscal cost, but you have everything there. You have very well target, not so well target, very pro rich type of transfers. So, and we, we didn't make this choice, you know, of separating the good from the, the, the not so good um, uh, uh, transfers. Second point with respect to the, I think, your question about this money abroad. I think illustrates well a point I was raising there. So Brazil in 2015, uh, you know, create the opportunity of those people who have money abroad to bring it back, uh, you know, and then so you have to pay tax. I don't want to know what's the origin of those resources. Okay, so what this, how this will impact measures of top incomes. So, you know, this change in the institutional framework may, you know, and I think this is happening the whole time. We, not, we cannot take it face value, especially when you're looking at the, the change, because, you know, something like that, you're going to say, well, the wealth in Brazil just exploded in the middle of a recession. <laughs> not exactly, you know. So it's, it's, it's really a, 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 a very difficult. And j just one last point on the gender issue. I think, you know, the, uh, there's some work by Cecilia Machado showing, uh, you know, using the same data, the impact of mother's leave on, uh, you know, on an, uh, an employee of, you know, a, a wage differential by gender gap on. And, and I think that perhaps, you know, uh, I think there is a, an analysis to do not only related with gender, but with the mo motherhood. You know, like a Bolsa Familia, you give money to mothers to take advantage of altruism and to empower. So I think there is a, a really a line of research. It was mentioned yesterday, not treat, you know, males and females as perfect substitutes in a way. And I think there are quite nice experiments to, to, to test this. Mary? Uh, so a few, a few comments in. So the point about gender is completely right. It's not absent from our studies. It was absent from my presentation. Um, but I think we could do much better in the stock take as a very, very interesting lens of a South Africa where we've had very low growth rates 
one little brief period of nudging towards 5% from 2002 to 2008. And the impact of that with masses of females coming into the labor market, finding themselves in the informal sector, which is in our data, we've got full earnings, if you like. Um, and so we can tell that story. And then we've got the top end of the income distribution as well uh, through some of these matching things. So we've got a very rich way of saying how disadvantage comes through by, by females finding themselves in precarious work, by, by et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, coming to, to uh, Giovanni's point about um, the structure of the economy, yeah, uh, but the earnings data also show that the top end of the South African earnings distribution who argue that their wages are set internationally, well, it turns out that their wages are way higher than their international comparators. So there is some sort of, there is a structural issue in South Africa, but, but mining has declined dramatically. Uh, Lawrence was knows the story super well. He's, he's the South African champion on this stuff. Uh, and services have increased a lot. And we're terribly worried about the skills twist, which pitches up in the earnings functions because it gets mapped onto what's been going on in the economy about the increased demand for skilled labor and the falling away in the demand for unskilled labor at the very same time as we've got a huge unemployment problem. So it's not just an employment problem, it's a, it's an unemployment uh, problem. And uh, so, uh, so you're right that the structure of the economy is a very important part of the story, but it's got its own particular South African manifestation, I think.